Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Today, our topic of discussion is going to be frozen embryo transfer or embryo cryopreservation. I'm talking about a topic here which is probably one that has gained a lot of attention in recent times because people are now beginning to realize that you can do embryo transfers and expect at least as good a result as you will when you do fresh embryo transfers. Let me explain. The very first frosty baby, or the very first frozen embryo that resulted in the birth of a child was in the 80s. Ever since then, probably around, I don't know, a few thousand fr uh, frozen embryo transfers that result in births. But it wasn't until about 15 years ago that the technology developed to the point that the chance of success was dramatically improved. Until the advent of new freezing methods, one we'll talk about in a few moments called vitrification, embryos were frozen slowly and progressively and cooled down until they reached the solid state. In the process of doing this, ice would form inside the cells and with the expansion of these ice crystals it would destroy the cells and the result was that many of these embryos didn't survive the freeze thaw. And for those that did, the chance of it resulting in a baby was very dramatically reduced, probably no more than 50% of what it would be with fresh embryos. For that reason, most people in our field were not recommending frozen embryo transfers or freezing embryos except to uh, retain and store those that were left over after an IVF cycle, to give the patient more or less a decent chance or some chance of getting pregnant later on with those embryos that were left over. Today things have changed. Approximately 10-15 years ago we got introduced to a new method of freezing called vitrification. This method is about 60,000 times faster than the old slow method of freezing. In fact so fast that ice would not form inside the cells. And the net effect was that the embryos weren't harmed because there was no damage to the in, in, internal part of the cell. And when you thawed these embryos, they were, those that survived the thaw were at least as viable as the day they were frozen. In fact, here about 90% of the embryos would survive the freeze-thaw. Now, it went one step further because using vitrification, we were able to show that we could achieve pregnancy rates and baby rates that were at least as good as that which occurred when you transferred embryos fresh in the same cycle. Because obviously freezing an embryo means that the transfer would take place at a later date in a subsequent cycle. The point here is that the new method of freezing has now gained such popularity that people are now starting to, to, to believe with good reason that there are significant advantages to freezing embryos almost routinely and I predict that in the next 10-15 years freezing of embryos and the subsequent thawing of them for transfer at a scheduled predetermined time in a later cycle will become more the routine in IVF. There are those that say that the results are even better and they probably are. The question we need to ask ourselves if they're better why Clearly freezing an embryo is not going to make it more healthy and some, very few, but some don't survive the freeze even with vitrification. But the main reason for the improved results, if they are improved, is that we can better prepare the uterus, the soil, for the seed the embryo to be transferred to, to impl be implanted in. And that is why we can we, when we do freezing and prepare the, the uterus for a subsequent embryo transfer of the thawed embryo, we can target the hormonal uh, uh, treatment to prepare the uterus, the repl replacement therapy, and do it better than happens when we stimulate a woman and we have to deal with all the hormonal changes and all the hormones produced in the ovary during that freezing, during that stimulation process with fertility drugs. We have no way of controlling which hormones and in what concentrations they reach the uterine lining. 
And so it is that with frozen transfers, the lining is probably far better prepared than it can be when you stimulate a woman with fertility drugs and rely upon the ovary to provide the estrogen and the progesterone in the appropriate arrangement. There are things, there are hormones other than progesterone and, and estrogen that are also produced during the stimulation or augmentation after egg retrieval. So therein lies, I believe, the advantage. So what is it then that we need to do to prepare people for frozen transfer? Well, we've spoken about how you get the uterus prepared. The freezing by vitrification is really pretty straightforward. You follow a, a recipe of doing so, and people that have got the skill, the necessary skill, laboratories that are in uh, centers of excellence can do this very, very well. The issue is how you prepare the uterus. And there are different ways that are used to prepare the uterus for the embryo transfer when you thaw, use thawed embryos. The one way is the natural cycle. Rely on the woman's own ovulation, determine when she ovulates, and then wait five days or six days and put the, trans the, the frozen embryos, thaw them and put them into the uterus. This may sound as being the more natural and physiological way of doing things, but unfortunately, there can be variations uh, in hormonal support of the cycle in natural cycles. A woman can have normal cycles all along and then with the stress of going into a frozen embryo transfer cycle without hormonal preparation, she can have dysfunctional ovulation in that cycle. And you can't predict in real time what's going on except when the ovulation is taking place. There's one other major problem and that is that as was shown some years back, I'm talking about more than a decade ago, by Jacques Cohen um, many years back, the window of implantation for transferring embryos in a natural cycle is very narrow. You have to be very, very precise on within hours of when the embryo is put in the uterus to get good results. And that, of course, creates problems because it's not that easy to be precise. A far better way to, to, to do frozen embryo transfers is to administer hormones in the appropriate dosage and route to prepare the uterus properly. Now, there are various ways that this is done. The one is by taking pills, estrogen pills, to build the hormonal lining and create appropriate um, proliferation of the uterine lining to prepare for the progesterone that then follows. And after you start the progesterone, then you've got about five or six days to put the embryo in, but only here, the window of implantation is not as narrow. So you don't have to be as precise to the hour and you can get good results even if you're out by a day or half a day. But preparing the uterus by giving the woman oral estrogen to take doesn't deal with a major problem that we encounter. And that problem is that whenever you take something by mouth, it gets absorbed and first must take a pass through the liver before it reaches your systemic circulation. So by the time the estrogen you ingest in the form of estrace, or progenova or whatever the time you when you've ingested it by the time it reaches the uterine blood supply it's passed through the liver and it reaches there in an altered state the common one that is used is called estrace and the problem with estrace is that a lot of estrace a greater percentage of estrace is converted to estrone one of the estrogen derivatives that can be harmed Estrace reaches the uterus, uh, a, a large amount of it reaches the uterus as estrone. And this can convert to male hormones which, if present in excess, can compromise development of the endometrial lining. A far better way to deliver the estrogen to the uterus to build the lining is parenterally. And you can do that, and what you mean there is to let it reach the systemic circulation directly without first passing through the liver. And this can be achieved by using skin patches of estrogen, estroderm and the like, daily or once every two days, or using what I much prefer over that method, which is injectable estrogen in the form of dull estrogen, estradiol valerate as it's known, injected twice weekly just under the skin. 
the absorption rate when you inject the estrogen is even, more evenly absorbed, and therefore it reaches directly the systemic circulation, gets straight to the uterus and has its effect. When you use uh, skin patches, you're dealing with issues such as humidity, the, the patches falling off, detaching, and variable rates of absorption so that it's not as even as you would find when you use injectable dalestrogen or also known as estradiol valerate. I much prefer the latter approach, it's more manageable and you only need to give the shot twice a week. Now to prepare the woman for either the oral or the injectable estrogen, my preference is to use a birth control pill to lead into the cycle so you can shorten or lengthen the cycle on the birth control pill and arrange that she has a period at exactly the right time. What I tend to do is overlap the pill as I do with regular stimulation with an agonist such as Lupron. Stop the pill, wait for the period and then begin the estrogen administration by injection. But as I said, it can equally be given by skin patches or orally, which I think is a poorer method of delivering the estrogen. So that's how we do it. And then when we, when we get to the point that the hormone blood level by the injections has reached, the, uh, has reached about 500 to, to 1,000 picograms per milliliter, uh, we then start to administer progesterone for five or six days. Then we thaw the embryos and a few hours later put back one or at the most two blastocysts that have been frozen in the uterus. Which brings me, and by the way, the hormonal support continues all the way through to the 10th week, 9th or 10th week of pregnancy with estrogen and progesterone because under these circumstances the ovary is not producing any hormones so you've got to supplement adequately. And I combine this with low dose dexamethasone, which is a steroid therapy throughout the stimulation up to the eighth week of pregnancy and then slowly decrease it till it's gone. And this can be done safely if you don't give it too long. And it will improve or immunomodulate the uterus, improving its receptivity, in my opinion. Now, it's important to point out that um, using embryo freezing is most uh, applicable when we have situations of leftover embryos. A woman has a few embryos uh, that reach the blastocyst stage, we put in two, there's still a few left over, we freeze those and we can provide these to the women later on and they can have them put in in a subsequent cycle and have the same chance of getting pregnant as they did with a fresh cycle. But here I want to emphasize the importance of taking the embryo to the blastocyst stage that's day five or six before freezing. Many doctors are now choosing to freeze embryos the day after they fertilized, keeping them in the so-called pronucleate state and freezing them. And then when it comes to a cycle for frozen embryo transfers, thawing the pronucleates, which haven't even yet divided into two cells, and then allowing them to develop to blastocyst before putting them back. I see this as problematic because those embryos that don't make it to blastocyst are almost in Those embryos that don't r reach the blastocyst stage of development are almost invariably abnormal. And if you freeze embryos in the pronucleate state, you have no idea when you thaw them, which of them are gonna survive. There's no way you can prognosticate, advise your patient because if many of them are abnormal, they may not even reach the blastocyst stage. And she's gone through all of the preparation for nothing. I prefer to take embryos to blastocyst stage where many of the abnormal ones will cull out along the way and not survive, giving the woman the best possible chance that when the blastocyst is put back in the uterus, the chance of a baby will be far greater regardless of age. So that's my, my personal preference. Now who besides women that have leftover embryos are good candidates for embryo freezing? Well, firstly, we get women where there's third-party parenting, especially when we do gestational surrogacy. As you know, when you use a third person or a gestational carrier to carry an embryo for someone 
who for whatever reason cannot carry a baby herself, her uterus has to be adequately prepared for that transfer. You can do it fresh, but it's much more complex and it's much more difficult to bring the recipient as well as the person who produces the egg into sync with one another. And there's no advantage since we can give the same results, or if not better, when we freeze the blastocysts. So what I tend to do is to separate the cycle of the person producing the eggs and the embryos, freeze the blastocysts by vitrification, and then allow her to start looking for the right surrogate. Because remember, surrogacy is not inexpensive. It can cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to find a surrogate. And it's far better to first know you've got the embryo secured and frozen before you start on that leg of the journey. The same applies more and more for women doing IVF for the egg donation. And as I've told you before, some people use eggs that have been banked in an egg donor bank. And others prefer to use fresh eggs from a donor that is produced directly without banking those eggs. I mean, that's before they fertilized. There's little doubt in my mind that the latter is far better in terms of success. And while there's still many people who for, com who for convenience sake choose eggs from an egg bank, I believe that you're far better off in terms of success using a fresh egg donor. In this arrangement, you can choose the donor, stimulate her, remove her eggs, fertilize them with a male partner's sperm, generate embryos, take them to the blastocyst stage, and then vitrify them, and then come back at a later date and transfer them to the uterus of the recipient woman uh, at her discretion and time it appropriately. Moreover, if you choose, you can even biopsy those blastocysts and get a result, karyotype them, do PGS, and know whether which ones are normal, and then put the normal ones back for even a better result. And that brings me to the next point. The advent of PGS and embryo testing has introduced the era of a embryo banking. And we were the first people, I believe, ever to do embryo banking in the IVF field on a large scale. I published on this. So embryo banking allows you to get eggs from a woman and then fertilize them by injecting a sperm into each egg, we call it ICSI, generating the blastocyst, biopsying the embryos, and determining which of the, of the blastocysts are normal, and then selectively placing those embryos back in the uterus at a later date. But with embryo banking, you don't just do it in one cycle. You bank the embryos repeatedly over several cycles, resting one cycle between each stimulation cycle, and so you stockpile the embryos till there are enough of them, biopsy all of them in advance, and send away the biopsies for testing. And then you know which embryos are the ones that are most likely to be able to propagate a baby, and you can improve the chance of success. This especially works well in women that are older, who have fewer embryos because of diminished ovarian reserve, fewer eggs and embryos. And so you're able to stockpile them in this manner, do PGS testing, and, give so, and, and so to say, slow down the biological clock. For many women who absolutely refuse to do egg donation, repeated banking of embryos with PGS testing of the blastocysts, and then later on, after you've gotten enough of those blastocysts banked and stockpiled, selectively placing one or two back at a time, is an alternative to egg donation, one that I encourage to be considered in those cases where in spite of needing egg donation, patients are not willing to go that route. Now these are but some examples of how IVF with egg free, embryo freezing has changed the field. Egg freezing is a different topic for another time, but talking about embryo freezing, uh, I believe that we have now we are now approaching an era where most IVF is eventually going to be done using frozen embryos, giving us the opportunity, if necessary, to test them in advance genetically and chromosomally to know which ones are the healthiest ones for transfer. Now, before I leave you, I want to mention that if there are any of you that are interested in talking to me personally via Skype consultation, you should call 702 5 
702-533-2691. That'll get you to Julie, who is the concierge for all my patients. And she'll be happy to set you up with a, an hour-long Skype consultation with me to discuss your case in detail. Alternatively, you can go to my website, sureivf.com. S-H-E-R-I-V-F dot com. If you go there, uh, you'll be able to access my blog and read the large number of articles on the blog. All you do is find on the banner on the top of the home page of the web, you'll find a little section which says Dr. Scher's blog. Click on that and it will take you to the articles concerned or it will take you to an area where you can search for any given topic by typing in the topic of interest into the search bar, clicking and it'll take you to the article. But also on my website at shareivf.com, there's a little enrollment form where you can enroll online for a Skype consultation with me. Just read those instructions carefully and uh, submit that online and we'll be happy to get back to you. So. The final point is that if you want to reach Julie, my concierge, and not call her on the phone, you can email her at julie, J-U-L-I-E, at shareinstitute, dot, uh, julie at shareivf.com. And that will get her to her, work, to her, get her to her, get to her email, and she'll respond to you promptly. Thank you all very much for attending again. I hope this is helpful and give you some in insight into this whole very interesting and developing field of embryo 